taken the limits off. And so we serve a God who absolutely has no limits. If you study God, you find out that uh, he's omnipotent, he's all-powerful. It means there's no limits on what he can do. And then he's all-knowing, omniscient. There's, he knows absolutely everything about everything. Amen? And he's your father. He's your friend. Praise God. And so you have a friend in high places. A few years ago, about 20 years ago, they had this song, I've got friends in no places. Ah, you know, I kind of like that. A lot of people can, can relate to that. But uh, I've got a few friends in low places, but I've got one in a high place. Amen? In a very high place. He is the most highest. He's above all. So praise God. We serve him. He has no limits. There's absolutely nothing that he cannot do. The Bible says he can do more than you could ask or more than you could think. If you pray 24 hours a day and ask for everything you could imagine, God could answer one, every one of those prayers. But not only that, he could answer, you know, everybody in the world pray 24 hours a day. And God, could, God has the ability to answer every one of those prayers. Doesn't mean that he's going to answer every one of those prayers, that they're all his will. But he could. He has the ability to answer every one of those prayers. God can do more than you can ask. He can do more than you can think. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you can't calculate God. Some people try to calculate God, but they think God is limited by their limitations. Right. You know, or God's limited by the economy of the United States or the people around them or their body or, or whatever. They think God is limited by those things, but, but God has no limitations. And so there's an exhaustible supply in God that you could never drain. Whether it's finances, healing, glory, power, what love, whatever you, you know, whatever you think of, there's an exhaust God has an exhaustible supply of everything. And God has ways to meet your needs, to touch you, to change you, to move in your life that you've never even thought of. And so it's so easy for us to limit God with our limited intellect. Come on. And they say that people use about 10% of their brain. And I've seen people who use a lot less than that. But people use about 10% of their brain or their, their actual mental ability if they, you know, if they use their brain uh, right, and they, you know, they would uh, would be much more intelligent. But, but you know, our expectations determine what God is going to do in our life. God can only do what we believe that He can do, yes. and He will only do what we trust Him to do. And so, our expectations determine what He's going to do for us. And and so, the first thing that we have to do is we have to. Stretch our imagination, stretch our faith to be able to receive from God. Psalm 78, 41 says they turned back and tempted God, limited the Holy One of Israel. So it's talking about the children of Israel. They tempted God. How did they tempt Him? They tempted Him to slap Him upside the head. He was frustrated with them because of all, even though that He had done so many miracles in their lives, they still didn't trust Him. And you know, we can get down on the children of Israel but how many know that we're that way sometimes? Yeah. We've forgotten all that God has done for us. And when we face a new challenge or a new problem, we just totally forget about what God did last time. Yeah. What God did a couple of years ago, a few years ago. And we totally forget about that. And we don't realize that the same God who did it back then can do it now. Can you say amen? Yeah. And so the children of Israel, when it came to a challenge of going into the promised land, they turned back and they said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? In other words, they, they were not believing in God's ability to provide for them and they wanted to turn back. And, and you know, we don't always know how God is going to provide. You know, you don't know how exactly. But you know, we as people, we like to be able to figure that out and calculate it because we want security. And you know, we want security so we don't have to trust in God. But God fed them from manna, rained down manna from the sky. But he just gave them enough for every day. Yeah. Because he wanted them to, to trust him every day. Yeah. 
And you know, as people, you know, if we have enough for today, then we start worrying about tomorrow. Yeah. And you know, next month and next year, what am I going to do? Yeah. And God provided enough for today. Jesus said, don't worry. He said, he takes care of the birds. If he takes care of the birds, he's going to take care of you. Amen? Yeah. If he took care of you yesterday, he's going to take care of you tomorrow. Yeah. If he's taking care of you today, he's going to yeah. take care of you next month or next year. So God gave them enough just for one day. And so we as people, we want to have security other than God. You know? And sometimes when folks get a lot of money, and most folks go is to get enough money, so that is their security. Well, I have good news for you. I mean, I've got bad news for you. You can lose your money, but even if you don't lose your money, you can lose your life. Your only security is in God. That's all the security that you have. But the good news is that's all the security that you need. Yeah. Amen. God is everything that you need. And so they didn't want to live by faith, so they limited God. Let me ask you this today. How are you limiting what God wants to do in your life? Come on, think about all the things that God wants to do in your life. And people say, well, God can do anything. Yes, he can do anything. But we can limit what he does in our life. Amen. We can put limits on God. And so the Bible says he can do more than we could ever ask or think. More than we could ever ask for. And so, but it also says that God does it according to the power, his power that works in us. Amen? And so I can limit his power that's working in me. I can quench the Holy Spirit. I can, you know, get distracted and not spend time with him. I cannot pray. I cannot worship not hear the word of God and limit the power that's working in us. God works through me. Amen. His power works in me to accomplish the things that he wants to accomplish in my life. He's going to do it in partnership with me. Amen. I have to let his power work in me so that I can see the will of God done in my life. And you know, you don't really get guidance from God until you get full of the Holy Spirit. And that's when you receive guidance from God, when you get full of the Spirit. Amen? If you're not full of the Spirit, you're not hearing the voice of God like you need to, like you need to hear Him. And so God protects us. He provides for us. He supplies our needs by guiding us, by speaking to us. Amen? And as He speaks to us and as He leads us and as He guides us, then we're able to hear His voice. And so our faith in God's ability determines what we're going to receive. And so I determine how much of God I'm going to let work in my life by what I do and how I yield to Him and how I make Him my priority. Yeah. And so we can limit it. You can limit God with your thoughts. Yeah. Amen? Because your thoughts are either conducive to God or they're conducive to the flesh and, and to the enemy. And so what you think on matters. And what you think on has an effect or draws unseen forces into your life. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so when you renew your mind, you give God an opportunity to move in your life. Amen? And so when your mind gets filled with faith, you're opening the door to, to the supernatural, and you're empowering God to move in your life. Praise God. You've got to re renew your mind and, and know what the Word of God says. The Bible says faith comes by hearing. And so we have to constantly be reminded of what the Word says. I've learned so much over the years. I've heard the best teachers in the world. But how do you know what I heard a year ago or five years ago or ten years ago, fifteen years ago, doesn't do me any good today. I've got to hear it again. Amen. I've got to be reminded again because I forget. Amen. I've got to I've got to learn it all over again. You don't hear uh, scripture one time or hear spiritual truth one time and you've got it forever. You've got to hear it over and over and over again. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. Your faith is just as good as what you've heard lately. You can live with God in your finances. God said if we would tithe and give, he'd pour out a blessing upon us. And so we can limit him with our mind and say, wait a minute, there's not enough. I can't do that. I can't afford to do that. Or whatever other type of reasoning we want to we use. And we can limit what God could do in our finances. 
And so Jesus fed 5,000 people with just the boy's lunch. And the boy, you know, I'd have a hard time giving up my lunch. I don't know about you. You know, I don't even like to give up some of my french fries or my cookie. You know, and, and uh, sometimes it's hard to share. But, you know, they got the boy to give his lunch away. And he went home with 12 lunches because he was willing to give his lunch. But Jesus took what he gave, he blessed it, and he multiplied it. Amen? God takes what you give, he blesses it, and he multiplies it. How can you afford to tithe and give? Because God blesses it, he multiplies it, and he brings it back to you in so many different ways. And so, uh, in another story, in the Old Testament, there's a widow woman who told Elijah that she owed debts and the creditors were going to come and, and take her sons. And they could do that back in that day. And so he asked her, he said, what do you have in your house? She said, I just got a little old. He said, well, go borrow some vessels. He said, and don't get a few. In other words, get as many vessels as you, as you could get. Because God was going to fill the vessels. In other words, it was up to her faith what she received. He said, don't get a few. And so... She could have limited God, or she could have limited God by the number of vessels that she got. But she got as absolute, absolutely as many vessels as she could get, and God filled up every one of them. But God used what she had to bring a miracle of provision in her life because she was obedient to the Word of God. The same thing is true that, that you know, your financial miracles are going to come through using what you have. Not what you don't have. People say, you know, I would do this and I would do that, blah, blah, blah. No, but it, but it comes with doing with what you have. Amen? Amen? God's able to multiply it. You can limit God by your prayer life. Or let me say your lack of a prayer life. You can limit God. God knows absolutely everything. He knows exactly what you need. But the law of prayer says, ask and you will receive. Amen? Amen? Then there's another law of prayer that said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, he said, you will ask and you will receive. Amen. So there's another law of prayer, which is abiding. In other words, uh, a relationship with God, fellowship with him brings answers to prayer. Amen. Because God supplies the needs of his children. You know, if a stranger asks me for a hundred dollars, I'm probably not going to give it to him. If it's somebody I don't know. But if one of my kids, I'd probably give it to Stan, or maybe a kid or something like that. But uh, but if my kid if my kid asked me for it and, and they really needed it, or my child, uh, I would probably give it to them if I had it and they needed it. Amen. And so God knows who loves him and who spends time with him and who doesn't just show up whenever they need something. Amen? And just, you know, they seek God whenever they need something. And if God has to hold your feet to the fire to get you to serve Him, He will. Amen? But I don't know, I don't know about you, but I'm going to, come on, I'm going to worship and pray and spend time with God when, I'm, when things are going well. Amen? And I'm going to do it if things aren't going well. But I'm going to spend time with God. But the law of prayer says that you have to ask in order to receive, and there's other laws of prayer. I don't have time to teach on all of them this morning, so, but you have to ask in faith. And that's what that's kind of what I'm teaching on this morning, is asking in faith and not limiting what God wants to do. Yeah. But the law of prayer says ask and you will receive. John Wesley said God does nothing except an answer to prayer. Yeah. Amen. So your lack of a prayer life will, <laughs> will limit what God can do in your life. If you don't ask then you don't receive. And of course, prayer needs to be based on the Word of God. To really pray effectively, you need to pray the Word. If I'm praying, I usually use scriptures when I pray. Whereas I find out what the will of God is before I pray. I already know what He said He would do. And God said, remind me of my Word. Amen. Remind me of my Word. And so I quote God His Word whenever I pray. Come on, if it's for protection, I quote the 91st Psalm. It's a, if it's provision, I'm quoting God. You know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Amen. Or my God shall supply all of my needs. And so, and so prayer needs to, effective prayer needs to be based on the word of God. And so, sometimes folks set limits on their life based on what's happened in the past. And past failures will cause them to stop trying or to stop asking. And they will just give up because of past failures. And that's what the devil wants you to do. 
Amen. But because that things haven't worked in the past, doesn't mean that God's not going to answer in the future. Maybe the timing wasn't right. And I read the story about, this is back in the 1800s, there was a, a silver miner. And he had a stake and he had a mine. And so he dug for years and never hit anything. And he, he sold the mine. And you know, I don't have all the details of this. But, uh, but he sold the mine and then somebody bought it. And they dug a few more feet and they hit the Comstock low, which was billions of dollars of silver. He quit too soon. There's a problem in quitting too soon, amen? Jesus thought perseverance in prayer. Why? Because there's opposition. There's timing. There's, there's other things. And, and you've got to pray according to the Word of God. But you have to be faithful, amen? Because God has a timing. And he's working on the details. And just because you can't see it doesn't mean that it's not happening. Amen? But God has a perfect time. The devil will try to hold things back. But if you're persistent in prayer and taking your authority in Christ, he can't hold it back. Amen? Or he can't hold it back forever. But he wants to. And so, you know, they have, I've never watched one, but they have flea circuses. You know, in fairs and different places. And people have a little aquarium, you know, and they've got these fleas trained to do tricks. And some of them would jump a couple of inches, and some of them would jump a foot, some of them would jump a couple of foot. They just, you know, they're just going off and having a little circus. And uh, maybe I'll get to see one of those one of these days. But they train those fleas, they put them in different size containers. And so they'll put that flea in, you know, three foot, four foot. They can really, they can really jump high. But, but they train them, they put them in those containers, and after a while, after they hit their head on the ceiling, they don't try to jump any higher because they get used to that size container and they don't try to do any more. And I was thinking a lot of people are like that. Come on, they try to get out of their limitations. They hit their head a few times and they just stop trying. They pray a few prayers. They don't see the answer in a week or two and they stop trying. They tithe for a few months. And they don't see any great blessing. Matter of fact, you know, maybe the devil attacked them and, and you know, things got worse. But they're not persistent. Amen? And so they just stop trying. But I found out that the Word of God always works. And even when it doesn't look like it's working, it's still working. Amen? And I found out when I persist and when I'm faithful, God always comes through. Praise God. And so, an angel appeared to Mary and he told her she was going to have a child, even though, you know, she didn't have a man. And then he said, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Yeah. And Mary's response was, be it unto me according to thy word. Yeah. Amen. Her response was, yes, Lord. And when God wants to do something in your life, you just need to say, yes, Lord. Whether you understand it or not, whether you see how it can come about or not, you just got to say, yes, Lord. I remember I was here in 1986 in Effie Ward, or 1985, and Effie Ward prophesied over me, you know, you're going to go into vocational ministry, blah, blah, blah. And I, you know, I didn't understand how it could happen or anything else. I just said, yes, Lord. And took a leap of faith, a stretch of faith, went to quit my job, went to Bible college, and not knowing, you know, what was going to happen. And, and so God took us, and I mean, there was some tough times, and and it was a total stretch of faith for God to take me out of my security into something that was unknown. And I had to totally trust God. But I just said, yes, Lord, to a prophetic word. And God was able to bring it to pass. And I had doubts many times when it didn't seem like things were working out. And I was a young man. And as a young man, I was very impatient. If God didn't do it in six months, and you know, I didn't think it was working or whatever. And, of course, I'm older now, and so I'm able to look at the long term. Five years is nothing. Ten years is nothing. Amen. You start looking at things in the light of eternity. And, uh, and so I thought if God didn't do it in a few months, and it wasn't going to happen. Amen. And you started looking for a plan B. But I found out that God's word is always sure. All God needs from you is just a yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I trust you that it will be unto me according to what you have said. Praise God. And God doesn't tell you how. He doesn't tell you where. He doesn't tell you when. He doesn't tell you who. 
You just have to trust Him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And so, when you agree with God and you say, yes, Lord, that opens the door to the supernatural happening in your life. And so, uh, Mary asked the angel, how these things are going to happen? The angel said, the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. How do you know when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you have supernatural power. You're not the same person that you are without the Holy Ghost. And when you walk in the flesh, you don't have much power. But when you get filled with the Spirit, there is a divine enabler. There is a divine helper who can equip you, who can give you wisdom, who can give you power, who can bring you through, who can do miracles in your life. Amen. Don't look at yourself. Don't rely upon yourself. But you have to rely upon Him. And so Jesus told us how to open the door to the supernatural. Matthew 9, 27 says, And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came unto him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe you that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were open. So Jesus asked these, these men, he said, Are you, Do you believe that I am able to heal you? That's just the basic level of faith. Do you believe that God is able to do it? Faith begins with believing that God is able to do it. And you say, well, that's very simple. But many times when we look at problems and situations, we don't believe that God is able to do it. Yeah. Come on, some of you are here today, you look at your problem, you look at your situation, and you really don't believe that God is able to do it. Yeah. Or that he, that he is willing to do it. Yeah. Or that he's going to do it. But that is just, that is the starting point of faith, the first level of faith. Do you believe that God can do his job? Do you believe that God can heal your body? Do you believe that God can supply your needs? Do you believe that God can change your family members? Do you believe that God can give you peace? Amen? Do you believe that God can protect you? You just have to believe that God is able to do it. Amen? And I've talked to a lot of people who don't believe that God is able to do it. And they said, this is an impossible situation. It's an impossible situation. I don't see any way out. Blah, blah, blah. Little despair. You know, agony upon me. Deep, dark depression. Severe agony. And uh, that's an old song for y'all who remember Hee Haw. So, uh, how many remember Hee Haw? Yeah, we used to watch that every Saturday night. That's one of the few shows my parents would let me watch. But uh, anyway, and so faith begins with believing that God is able to. Jesus touched their eyes and they were healed. And so your faith will determine what you receive. And if you believe that God is able to do it, he wants to get you into And so the devil wants to fight your faith. If it takes faith to be able to receive from God, the devil wants to fight your faith. He wants to get you into the arena, the arena of your reasoning and your mind. Yeah. Which compared to God is very small. Amen? And what you can figure out, what you can calculate. That's, that's the arena the devil wants to get you in. You know, what the, you know, what the doctors say, what the economists say, what the news says, what your neighbor said, what the your hairdresser said he wants to get you in the area what the people on Facebook said yeah. he wants to get you in the area of your reasoning yeah. because if he gets you in the area of your reasoning he's got you defeated yeah. come on because you don't receive by God from your intellect come on but faith is not of the intellect faith is from yeah. God amen yeah. believing that God can do the impossible faith is beyond your intellect Everything that God does is impossible. Did you know that? Yeah. Everything that God does is impossible. And so if you don't believe that God can do the impossible, you're not going to receive anything from God. It's impossible for a person to change. How many of you have heard that before? People don't change. They'll tell you that. You know, and, and people don't change. If God changes people. Amen? It's impossible for somebody's body to be healed. According to science and doctors and Everybody else. It's, um, it's impossible. Some of you are living the impossible financially. Yeah. And what some people would have said impossible. Or what uh, in your mind you would have said is impossible. But God is a God who does the impossible. Yeah. Not limited by us. Not limited by our reason. What, what you think or what somebody else thinks. Yeah. Amen. And so, 
God just needs a yes from you. Amen. If he wants to do something in your life, he just needs a yes. All the promises of God are yes and amen. Amen. All the promises of God are yes. You just got to say yes. Come on. God said he's healed you. You just got to say yes. God said he'll provide you a mate. You just got to say yes. He didn't say what kind of mate, but he said he'd provide you a mate. You just, you got to say yes. Amen. God said he'll supply your needs. You got to say yes. There was a movie that came out about 10 years ago called The Yes Man. I came from him. Jim Perry was the actor in it. He's just an ordinary guy. He's a loser. Nothing's going well in his life. His friend invites him to a convention of the Yes People. It's this organization named Yes. So he goes to the Yes Convention and, and they, they teach people to say yes to everything. And yes to the possibilities in life. And, and so they're all yelling, yes, yes, yes. And so he walks out the door and, and a homeless man asking for a ride. And you know, and he's a rough looking person. You know, he would normally say no, but he just got out of the yes convention. So he says yes. He gives this homeless man a ride. And, and so while he's taking this guy wherever he's going, he runs out of gas. He goes nowhere. And so this young woman comes up and, and helps him get gas. And he meets her, and then uh, they start dating. And so he's got a beautiful new girlfriend, all because he said yes to the homeless man. And so he gets a job as a loan officer in the, in the bank. And, and so uh, instead of qualifying people for loans and all that, he just starts saying yes to all the applications. Yeah. And loans, anybody who wants money, money. And, uh, and so suddenly the bank is making you know, many more loans, high interest loans, and making much more money. So he gets promoted to be a branch manager. The bank's making more money than he's ever made. He's successful. He's got a beautiful girlfriend. All because he said yes to a homeless man. So remember that the next time somebody walks up and asks you for money or asks you, or asks you for a ride. But he said yes. But you know that reminded me. we got to say yes to God. So many people say no to God. When God tells them, you know, ask them to do something or they get some kind of promise, they say no. They get a prophecy that, you know, is out of their realm or their intellect or their plan for their life, and they say no. Yeah. And because of that, they mimic God and what he wants to do in their life. Amen. Amen. And so sometimes folks think, well, God is sovereign. He can do anything, which is very true. But God is also a God of character. In other words, uh, he has character just like you have character. God is good. He's merciful. He's loving. He wants to do good. And so he's bound himself by his word. Even though he has the power to do everything, he doesn't do it. God could kill you right now, but he doesn't do it. Why is that? Because he's a God of mercy. It's a good thing. Amen? Amen. And so God can do anything, but he works in cooperation with us. In Mark 6, verse 5, it says, He could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. He marveled because of their unbelief. Jesus couldn't do any mighty works in his hometown because they knew him. And they saw him growing up. And they said, we know this kid. He could have worked miracles. He's not the son of God. And because of that, he marveled at their unbelief. He said he couldn't do, he couldn't do any mighty works there. He'd done mighty works in other towns around there, but he couldn't do them there. One, tra one translation says he was astonished at their unbelief. They had so much unbelief that they were not able to receive. And so we know Jesus had the Holy Spirit without measure. He had the Holy Spirit without measure. We know he had all power and might. He could do mighty works, but he couldn't do them there. Come on, you can quote scripture right and left and still be full of unbelief. Yeah. And when God wants to do something in your life, you don't believe that he can do it or that he's going to do it and you give up. Now, there's two kinds of unbelief. The first kind is ignorance, just not knowing, not being taught or not being taught the right way. Yeah. Amen? Not all churches teach like this. Not all churches teach faith or the full gospel and so not being taught will, uh, will will give you unbelief not knowing and ignorance and so 
uh, you got to take time to hear the Word of God. And sometimes folks, they just want a quick solution from God without taking time to hear the Word of God. And knowing that they have to constantly hear the Word of God for their faith level to be what it needs to be. And so uh, the Bible says that Jesus went around teaching. And some folks think, well, Jesus just popped up and worked miracles. But Jesus was a teacher, primarily. And so he would teach, and then he would work miracles. And some people want a quick miracle without any teaching. They want a miracle without having any faith built in their heart. But miracles come from faith and from building and from hearing the Word of God. And so uh, T.L. Osborne said, he, you know, he was a great teacher and also worked a lot of miracles. And he said, people want me to quit teaching so they, they can get healed, so I'll pray for the sick. He said, but he said, they're waiting for me to quit teaching so they can get healed. He said, but I'm waiting for them to get healed so I can quit teaching. Yeah. What he's saying is that you can be healed by the word of God. The Bible says he sent his word and healed them. Amen. And when you get the word, amen, when you believe the word, you can receive your healing without somebody laying hands on you. Come on. And you can receive it right there, healed by the word. And so you have to know what the word says in order to be able to receive. Praise God. And you can be healed off somebody's gift, but anybody be, can be healed by acting on the Word of God and using their faith to act on the Word of God. And so if you've been prayed for numerous times and you have received, guess what? You need to change your thinking, change your believing, change your talking so that you're able to receive. Amen? Amen. So there's got to be an adjustment in you so that you're able to receive. Praise God. And so we have to, we got to hear the word of God. And if, if teaching wasn't important, then Jesus would have taught, right? God wouldn't have given us the Bible if it wasn't important, but it is important. And the second kind of unbelief is just unpersuadableness. That's what the children had, children of Israel had. And so God had done miracles for them. They knew what God had done for them. Yet when they faced a new challenge, they refused to go in. They refused to believe that, that God was going to do what he had promised him and what he said that he would do, and they were unpersuaded. And the cure for that kind of unbelief is just to take action. Amen? You've got to take action because faith in its true form acts. And the simplest definition of faith is acting like the Bible is true. Amen? Act like the Bible is true. The Bible says faith without corresponding action is dead. It's dead faith. And so a lot of folks, they've been, you know, they have been sitting in the pew here in the Word for 50 years, but nothing's happening because they're not taking the action on their faith. You've got to take action on it. And so the cure for that kind of unbelief is to take action. Praise God. You've you got to have more than just a knowledge of the Word. You've got to have knowledge of the Word, but you've got to take action. How would you act if you believe the Bible was really true? How would you act? How would you pray if you believed the Bible was true? Yeah. How would you walk and live in peace if you believed the Bible was true? Right. How would you act if you believed that God's going to supply all your needs, that you don't have a financial worry ever? Right. How would you act right. if the Bible was really true? How would you act if you believed that you were healed? Amen? Right. How would you act if you believed hey. that if God's for you, then nobody can be against you. How would you act if the Bible was really true? How would you praise God if you believe the promises of God and what God has said to you? Amen? Well, let's praise Him that way this morning. Let's stand to our feet. Come on. You can praise and act like the Bible is really true. Praise God. And some of you have been prayed for, but God's telling you to exercise your faith, believe that you've been healed. Some of you need to do something this morning that you hadn't been able to do. Amen.